thanks to all of you for dedicating your time, uh, despite your busy schedule. I'll pass on uh, so that each of you can introduce yourselves to the audience. Hi, uh, Tim Bozik. I. Oops. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Hi, uh, Tim Bozik. Um, my team heads up global product appears, which means we provide sort of research and development and product development for mostly higher education and English products globally. Hello, my name is Bill Lanforsa, and um, I lead US K 12 learning services at Pearson which basically, in other terms, is the business that focuses on the school, on the K-12 market. So my team creates the product, sells into districts, markets it, and provides the services across the K-12 uh, organization. Good afternoon, I'm Curtis Barnes. I actually work in Tim's organization. I have responsibility for product management in our uh, UXD function. Hi, good afternoon, Amanda Gardner. I lead sustainability and social innovation at Pearson, looking after our social, environmental, and economic footprint. Hi, I also work uh, in Tobosic Group. My name is Paul Corey. I'm the Managing Director for Higher Education Courseware. Uh, that's course content, learning tools across every discipline in higher education, except for law. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on, I'd like to thank all the companies that applied to this accelerator process over the past four and a half weeks. Uh, we got 40 companies um, applying to meet this mission. Um, and this fulfills not only Paul's core mission, but also Pearson's focus to deliver um, higher quality education for the served learners across different communities. Um, lack of access to quality education is a problem. It's a global challenge that um, is endemic to all developing countries and developed countries. Uh, what we're trying to do today is basically trying to call and seek for companies and ventures that are willing to um, provide services, quality services at low cost for underserved learners across different communities. Um, we'd like to announce the five companies today that best fulfill this mission and are most reflective of um, the pitch call. The judges will be judging the companies according to that best fulfills this criteria and fulfills across the six um, indicated um, categories out here. Um, so without further ado, we'd we'll like to just start the pitches. There are five minute pitches. Um, we have five minutes of Q&A for the judges to um, follow up with any questions you have. And we'd we'll like to call an audience to clap at the five minute mark. Um, we'll, we'll have the first company coming up here um, to pitch for us, a former college, so Sean, let's take the stage. First, I just want to say thank you, uh, Pearson and uh, EdTech Week, for having us at the session. It's sorely lacking in our industry, and uh, we need to focus more on the under resourced students that are in our schools. So, we're a public benefit corporation. My name is Sean O'Brien, I'm the founder of the company. We serve more than 10 million community college students across the country, nearly 50% of all our graduates. People don't realize how many students are out there in these institutions. So who are these students? I borrowed this uh, from a presentation that my counterpart at Onondaga Community College did at the Middle States Commission. And uh, she did a great job of showing you who these students are. You have 63% Pell eligible, and 80% of the low-income students are leaving without a credential. There's a dramatic need for innovation on these campuses. And just to get a, a little bit more insight, I've spent a lot of time in Syracuse in the last three months. Uh, and uh, you're talking to a lot of poor students. Um, they have the highest rates of both black and Hispanic concentrations of poverty in the nation. Two thirds of the black poor live in high poverty neighborhoods and 62% of Hispanic residents live in concentrated poverty. So if you wanna know where the students are that we're looking to help, they're at the community colleges. And here's the thing, people uh, who didn't go through this, a lot of whom invest money, uh, they don't understand what the aspirations of these students are. They want to transfer to a four-year school, and they want a degree. And I hear a lot in the industry about all the new and alternative models that are out there. And, and for me, they're serving other people's needs. This is what students want. I had uh, the uh, keynote at Edge Adventures in 2015 say that community colleges were all going to go out of business. 
I read an article in Forbes from one of the, the top VCs in our industry saying that community colleges should be placement colleges. And that, that same VC firm had a guy on a panel at the uh, GSB Summit in 2016 who said that one of their portfolio coding companies was going to be able to guarantee jobs to students. The other end of, the, of, that, of that panel, there was a community college president who very nicely said, hey, you know what, we can't, we can't promise people jobs, but we can get them interviews. And in that moment, it was very clear who really understands what these students need. It's the people that are the presidents of the community colleges, the people that are in the trenches with these students like Julie. The problem is we don't have enough students that are getting there. And there's a huge gap that we can fill, and that's our mission, is to increase the transfer rate at these community colleges so students can get where they need to go. So let's meet a student. She heads over to the community college website, goes to register for classes. It's open access. She can jump in any time. It's a very different experience. She's very successful, and she gets through the community college in two years. She's done everything right, overcoming transportation issues, overcoming a lot of different issues in her life, and she gets to her, her four-year university. And this is what happens. I spoke to somebody at NACAC who runs a huge public institution right now. They let their students know, in an orientation on campus, what their credit evals are. It's a terrible process that still goes on. What we're doing is we're providing information to students at the front end of the community college experience so that they can be successful. We're giving students the ability to look at what they're going to major in and where they want to go, and we're showing them, hey, you're headed down the wrong road. You might like to consider a different university where we have a verified pathway for you. When we do that, we introduce our partner universities who have done the work to make sure that these students are successful. And we intervene in the marketplace at the time when the student needs our help. So as a result, we're able to get her into the right courses. I spoke to the VP of enrollment at Cornell yesterday, his prospective customer. He said, we get all the students we need. They just don't have the right courses to, to enroll in our programs. We need to fix that, and they're going to work with us on it. Ultimately, this gives the student the ability to see from the front of the community college, hey, this is where I can go to achieve an affordable college degree. And we get them through to the partner universities uh, so that they can get where they want to go. This is what they want. This is what their desire is. So our model is free to students. Community college students are looking to save time and money. They do it with that product. We're free to the community colleges who are looking to increase readiness, enrollment, retention, and transfer rates. And we fund the community colleges, also part of our mission. And all of it is funded by customer universities who are looking to enroll students. Why affordable college? We've got a huge market. We get all the data from the community college built into our product, which makes us very attractive to four-year universities. We use the data to match the students with the right programs as early in the process as possible. When we introduce ourselves to new community colleges and universities, they introduce us to partners that we work with. We're going to grow this thing very aggressively into a network of 108 community colleges over the next five years. And we're having a lot of success. We have 130,000 students in our, in our uh, network, eight, eight community colleges, eight customer universities. We have a strong local pipeline, and we're helping hundreds of students right now. As a result, we're generating marketplace revenue and fees from, from universities who are subsidizing the development that we're doing in the process. We have a great group of people all committed to this who have contributed to everything that you've seen and are working with me behind the scenes to make this happen. And we're going to reach a lot of students. Our platform is going to be adopted by a lot of community colleges are going to make a big impact on students. And, uh, and we're looking for, for one or two people who might want to join us. And if you feel like that might be you, uh, I'm certainly happy to talk to you if you're interested in working with us to build up this product and make an impact on these students. Thank you very much. <laughs> Judges. Hi. <laughs> I can start. I have a question. Hi there, hey. thank you so much. Sure. Great presentation. Um, I love the model. I think it's much needed. And I guess my question is around those, uh, th those universities, those four-year institutions that are paying. Um, how, I, I, I think you went through a slide. How many universities have paid or indicated they will pay for this service? And do you have any indication of what the incentives are for doing it? So a lot of these students are presumably going to be requiring financial aid. So is it a numbers game that these universities want? these students to come in, in terms of their diversity numbers, or do you know anything about the incentives? The, the, I think the key is the, the, the demand from the university. So we have eight, eight community uh, universities who are paying us, whether they're paying us uh, fees up front for newer yeah. partners, and they're paying us in uh, tuition sharing for students who are transferring through the marketplace. Uh, in terms of the demand, I emailed the president at Cornell, and within an hour I got a meeting with the VP of enrollment. So we have a, a big pipeline. Uh, they're looking for something different than the average school. The average school obviously is looking for enrollment. 
if anybody lives in the state, you know that the private college is under a lot of pressure. So really it's that transfer enrollment of, uh, of learners and then diversity is also is also something. But to be honest with you, they see the issue and they, they want to be able to bring students in with the right credits from a mission perspective as well. Thank you. Sean, you indicated you have a big team already in place. What is that team working on right now? Uh, the data. So the product that you see, the way you see it, only works with the data um, in a database that's connected so students can see what they need. So we are working very closely uh, on uh, making the product work in a way that can be automated for students. Sean, let me ask you a question. <laughs> we'll go back to the 80-24. 80 80% yeah. and 10, 24% transfer. What's the number that you think it should be? Uh, Do you think 80 would be oversubscribed? Uh, I don't see how. I mean, I think we have capacity. So I don't mean to sound prov provocative, but um, let's, do let's do it. Okay. We have a 70-year infrastructure rebuild in this country. Uh -huh. Bridges, elevators, tunnels, highways, HVAC, welding jobs uh -huh. are in very high demand. And I happen to know this because we publish a careers list that's all vote tech mm. and it's growing at the fastest rate of all of our lists it's not the largest list but it's growing at a very fast rate right. so would we be underserving society if we were to get to 80 percent i think it depends on who you're who are we serving so for whom who does it who does that line of questioning serve to me it sounds like it serves the employer so i'm first and foremost focused on the students and i didn't say it but i mean we talk about what you know a lot and uh, what's needed for employers, but uh, a uh, good friend of mine, an older gentleman, said to me one time, hey, Sean, it's, Sean, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's who knows you. And uh, I think that people that are heading to these schools want the same thing that a lot of us get, and that's uh, close relationships with people that will help them through time. And we can figure out how to work that in, too. So I think your, your, your question also assumes that we can't work that into the degree path. We can't. It's just the whole world of alternative is more enthralled with focusing there versus actually working with people that are helping these underserved students. Okay, thanks. Um, sure, Sean. So I, it, it's clear to me the benefit to sort of students in community colleges. Can you tell me a little bit more on the, the transfer colleges? Um, specifically, what are they getting other than I, I get qualified students? Um, but maybe in... in other terms, if, if a transfer college hasn't signed up for you as a client, why not? Uh, okay, so fundamentally, they need their pathways implemented properly to get the result that they want, which is a qualified student with the right courses leading into their programs. So obviously, foundationally, we're introducing them students for them to generate revenue and enrollment. Um, why not? I mean, people in higher ed probably don't move as, as quickly as others, and they internally have to think about, uh, for a period of time, which tends to be about three months, hopefully we'll shrink it, like what does this mean for us? And that could mean something different for the registrar, to the, the uh, provost, to the president. So it's really just a facilitating that relationship and communicating clearly so that they can see how we can help them, and then demonstrating our position in the marketplace effectively so that they, they have to respond to us. One last question. Um, how do you reach the actual uh, students who are in the community colleges? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, how you reach question. them? So the, we, we effectively become the outsourced transfer center for the community college. So the student will go to the website, they'll see our product, advisors will refer students to our product, we'll have signage in the school, and then also we get the database from the, from the community college. So we can communicate freely with all the students. And how many community colleges have signed up? Eight. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mehmet Mutanich, and I'm the founder and CEO of Smart Profession. And I'm Julio Casado, the Chief Education Officer of Smart Profession. We are a middle skill career training platform. Let me define middle skill first. Middle skill jobs are the jobs that don't require a college degree, yet some training beyond high school. 
Now the problem is there are millions of unfilled middle school jobs out there, yet there's an extreme shortage of middle school professionals. On top of that, there's a lack of low-cost, career-specific middle school career training uh, solutions. To solve those problems, we're going to create a new category. We are the first platform that combines personal mentorship with on-the-job training for middle school careers. So our target learners are 22 to 35 year olds who are attending community colleges, workforce development centers, as well as part of trade associations. We're looking to upskill these individuals and help them develop job, uh, skills that are in demand uh, in the economy. They tend to be unemployed or underemployed in the freelance economy and located in urban areas. So our platform increases access to learning for them by first and foremost providing no upfront cost and no opportunity cost. Our learners don't need to give up their current wage earning activities to participate in smart professions. We provide personalized and flexible blended learning programs for them. We help them build and be able to prove their competency in the marketplace by providing them with real world work portfolios. And lastly, we provide them with access to mentors who are subject matter experts in their field. As you can see across the uh, current landscape, we're really solving for three big problems uh, facing other alternative learning solutions. Uh, our learners, many learners are unable or unwilling to learn self-directed. We solve for that through blended learning. We provide the on-the-job training. It's at no cost. And then we also help them with personal mentoring. Our business model is based on connecting jobs, mentors, and fellows. Through fellowships, we generate products and services in addition to trained fellows. We launched our first product, which is our MVP in audio production uh, fellowship. We got a contract from a German publisher. We produced three audiobooks while training two fellows. We generated $5,000 in revenue and real world work portfolio for the fellows. That year. We are planning to produce, uh, I'm sorry, we are planning to launch two programs in uh, 2018, podcast production and audiovisual technician. We are researching about the, pro the areas that we can launch programs in. Uh, that includes AI debugger and data cleaner. So we're focusing on um, building programs that are in demand in the marketplace. So audiobooks and podcasts are both uh, growing industries. Uh, the way that we're going to attack uh, or go to market is by uh, working with indie authors and small publishers on the audiobook side, joining appropriate trade associations, as well as using social media tools to reach our learners and potential clients. The audiobook industry is a $2.1 billion industry and growing year over year. Similarly, the podcast industry is also growing, bring, expected to bring in about $400 million in ad revenue in 2018, which is bringing in more aspiring podcast uh, producers as well as small business owners who want to use this medium to reach their markets. I'm a very passionate educator and an audio engineer. I spent more than 7,000 hours teaching audio engineering in classroom settings. This is why I know one size doesn't fit all. Actually, I've seen a lot of students having a lot of problems after completion of the program. I've seen grads not getting jobs. In that regard, I'm very passionate about uh, social impact and innovation in education as well. And I have a background in talent strategies as well as operations management. I helped the company uh, through a workforce development project establish a methodology and understand how a new systems implementation would impact 600 jobs across the manufacturing facility. I also helped recruit and staff corporate intern programs as well as rotational programs across multiple business units. Lastly, in 2014, I launched a college access program here in New York City targeting high school and community college kids, helped them enter college as the president of La Unida Latina Foundation. Dane is an excellent professional with a strong background in audiovisual engineering and studio management. He also holds certifications in the areas we will launch programs in. Speaking of which, we have a very strong and diverse team of mentors which will help us launch the programs in audio. We are raising $300,000 to launch new programs in audio to support our full-time employees and to improve our branding and learning, ma learning management systems. So join us in building a middle-skill career training solution for the fourth industrial revolution. I have a quick question, uh, actually two quick questions, so maybe one for each of you. Um, was the decision to start in New York City data-driven or convenience-driven? Let me ask that question. I was here, I taught at New York Academy Institute of Audio Research for seven years in total, and I just happened to be here, so 
I started here, but we are at the target of our demographic density. So mm -hmm. maybe I was lucky. <laughs> okay, second question is also uh, quick. Um, do you, how do you screen and ultimately appoint the mentors and do you evaluate their work, their efficacy at different stages? So let me start answering, maybe you can add a few things. The best assessment tool for us is peer review and um, there's nothing better than you know, the feedback from the company you just serve. So we produce three audio works and you know, they are being uploaded as we speak right now to ACX Audible's you know, distribution channel. And this is a startup from Germany. They just raised $4 million to launch a new branch here in New York City. So that's a good validation. Another thing is, we have mentors who, some of which have Grammy you know, awards. They have their name you know, on, as the credits list. So they will have to make sure the quality is like top notch. So that's another thing. And we also look for mentors who have experience, some level of experience in the classroom. Yeah. Whether it be traditional classroom experience or help others uh, develop the skills that we're looking to help others develop. So it's a blend between industry professionals as well as some education experience. Thank you. Thank you. What's the size of the target population? Now, we are trying to reach by 2020 45 million people in total. That's the middle skill gap. Uh, I think released by a report by ATD. Um, and that's our global reach right now. But for next year, for example, we are trying to reach 125 in total in the niche areas that we're launching programs in. But middle skill, middle skill gap is the fastest growing gap. Just in the United States, we're going to have 5 million jobs unfilled if left unaddressed by 2000. And uh, just to add to that, it actually touches a little bit on your question as well. The freelance economy is outpacing employment growth compared to the traditional full-time market and is concentrated in urban areas such as in New York City. So by focusing on helping them upskill into freelance gigs, we're really helping them provide with increased employment opportunities they may not traditionally have access to. I have a question. Um, really interesting. Uh, business. A couple of questions. First is, if you can go over in terms of what your financial model is, how does it actually work? How do you get paid? And the second is, I understand where you started in terms of the career focus area. What is your criteria on how you select the different career verticals and how you plan to grow? So let me answer with how this work first. We get a contract, a freelance contract from a company, and we assign fellows to work on the project under supervision of our mentors. So we operate the whole experience, the learning experience as well as production, and then we deliver the job and get paid. Since the fellow is not paying not anything out of pocket, we have it and we're not paying them, they're not paying us, we have a very low cost in terms of you know, expenses. So that's our competitive advantage when it comes to um, business model. In other words, we're not charging the learner, we are charging the company who receives uh, these services. And you're guaranteeing me a job if I come and do this training? We, we don't guarantee acceptance, but once you're accepted, after the admission process, yes, we, we actually connect you with the job. So if I could build on Blom's question, so her second one was, how do you establish a pipeline of other sectors? Yeah. But if I understood your answer to the first question, um, how do you build your business development pipeline? Because yes. I just heard you got a contract from somebody in a yes. sector you are you know, and therefore you have a network. Yes. I understand 45 million in the yes. middle skills, and you're starting with what you know. But tell us how you're going to scale outside this niche. So um, part of scaling and establishing both that business development and other verticals is actually about meeting with companies. So we meet with companies to identify where are the gaps in the skill sets. Where are the gaps in, in their recruitment strategy? Um, and develop programs that fit within that gap. So literally by doing the research development for the other verticals, we're also establishing a pipeline of future clients that we can um, fulfill with this model. Tomorrow we're going to meet Dennis Mortensen from that Excel AI, an artificial intelligence company, and we're going to ask him what do you need. We had a number of meetings like this. First, a data cleaner who came from the guy. He said, I'm paying $150,000 to data scientists, and they're cleaning data. What if there was someone who just cleans data? They would do it way better in the long run and for cheaper. If you pay $75,000 to a high school grad who cleans data, that's a win-win situation for everybody. And to be a data cleaner. <laughs>
Can, can I ask one quick question on impact on the learner, please? I know you're serving the, the freelance economy, but are you tracking or do you have plans to track whether these temporary roles lead to other roles or lead to permanent employment for those individuals? Absolutely. We are actually just, we're just talking about today with the blockchain company, yeah. uh, tracking, you know, because it's freelance economy, so you have to have some sort of ownership of the product you just produce, even though you don't own it legally, especially when it comes to creating industries. It's a little tricky, but there are ways so we want to utilize blockchain in the long run. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that we uh, actually uh, connect with the right tools in order to assess and in order to keep the track of the product growth. And we are planning to have more fellows work for us as managers. <laughs> Dina Seifert and I both have, uh, she is also, and we have 50, uh, 50 years combined experience working directly with children who struggle with language uh, and literacy issues. Um, we are also published test authors of a vocabulary test, and we are the creators of Infocabulary, which is a web-based, device-agnostic K-12 tool that teaches nuanced vocabulary in using critical thinking and visuals instead of uh, relying on rote memorization. Words are the building blocks of language and therefore of all learning across all domains. This is a $5 billion, the vocabulary instruction is a $5 billion industry in just the US alone. And we plan on capturing a small portion of it, but still significant revenue. The existing pedagogy basically says, Bloom Taxonomy says, in order to arrive at critical thinking, you need to remember a lot of information, math facts, words. Currently, the rote memorization of unhelpful definitions is a very, very common practice. Take a look at this definition. It probably brings back memories of cramming information into your heads when you were in school. This was an actual definition of a sixth grade student I was working with, and he did not learn the meaning of the word prudent with this definition. We've turned Bloom's taxonomy kind of on its head, saying we're going to actually use critical thinking in the nonverbal domain and have kids use that and infer the meanings of words by giving them visuals that show the meaning of the word in a variety of contexts. We are the authors of the test of semantic reasoning, which was published when academic researchers, this vocabulary deficit is such a huge problem in education. Academic researchers were so excited when they found what we were working on and encouraged us to publish a test. It's not directly related to vocabulary, but it's important. We're the ones who have introduced this concept and this pedagogy and it's the secret sauce that's in vocabulary. So take a look, this is a screenshot of our climb mode, uh, the game mode in vocabulary. This is not a Rosetta Stone, pick the right picture. All four pictures are guiding you to think about a common thread. So what's the common thread between those four images? We do also have visuals and audio captions that guide students thinking. Find the common thread, and then which one word on the right goes with all four of those images that are showing things standing out in some way. So the answer for this one would be prominent. Teachers have a huge problem. They're relying on using language and tools that use language to teach language to kids who struggle with language. And that makes no sense. That's 34 million students in our country. Students who start behind the eight ball um, as they come into kindergarten with uh, behind the eight ball with their vocabulary knowledge they do not improve. Um, they might come in behind the eight ball because of poverty, because of a language or learning disability, or because English is not their primary language. That gap just continues to widen um, extraordinarily through the school years. As I said, academic researchers are really excited about what we're doing. The University of Virginia is one that's already done an independent research study. And what they found was students scored far higher on quizzes the weeks that the students used in vocabulary to learn uh, words compared to business as usual instruction. And the reason why was because they were better able to apply their newly found understanding of the words to new contexts. 
So actual learning had occurred. And then these are the results from a statewide assessment from one of our pilots uh, uh, schools in Maryland. So these are stay nine score improvements. That's really tough to do. Uh, and this was just with 20 minutes of instruction and homework. So our business model is based on $7.50 per student per, um, per year, it's recurring. Um, we've heard our product described as a must-have supplemental, um, and we have experienced a really nice conversion. Uh, we have a three-pronged sales strategy. We know that schools and districts are obviously our, our primary customers, but we understand the relationship between specialists, speech language pathologists, special educators, and parents, and how they feed into the, the decision makers in the schools. Um, I'm so excited this morning to say that um, actually in December, it's not even over yet, and we hit $45,000 this morning um, in recurring revenue um, in our annual contract value. We got a, um, a large pilot in Baltimore City Public School Systems. Uh, we, know our, uh, we know our competition. They're using language to teach language to kids who struggle with language, um, and they're not using semantic reasoning. These are just some of the um, customers, paying customers that we have acquired. And I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Hi, Ben. Hi. I'm the K-12 person, so um, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm familiar with some of the competitor product you showed. Could you please tell me what your sales, your go-to-market approach is? How are you currently selling to districts? Uh, a, B, if you're going to at the building level and walk me through in terms of how, you, how you're how you doing it today and what your growth plan is. Excellent. So um, Dina Siebert and I have been the ones who were the subject matter experts and it's been basically the two of us. We just hired a VP of sales that was funded through um, the the salary for that person was so um, was funded through Tedco. So we have a VP of sales who's going to help us who already has been selling in the literacy domain across 50 states. So that's, we're really excited about that. And the fact that that's being funded by a potential investor um, is, is great. But currently, it's we're, um, we're basically using relationships, extant relationships that we have. Um, we now have two um, pilots happening in, in districts. Um, we have private schools, and the way that works kind of, it's, it's a very interesting, um, you know, one school finds out, and then they start to see results like those state nine score improvements within two days of them finding, you know, the other independent schools and some public schools finding that out, they were on the phone with us asking. So that's kind of, it's been an organic growth. Uh, we do trade shows, we have, um, you know, and we're planning on hiring um, an inbound uh, salesperson and then expanding through that. So we're fiscally really conservative, um, but we're, we're planning on, on growing it rapidly next year. So you're gonna have a field sales force Correct. sell yeah. this, sell this and calling on districts or buildings? Um, probably the buildings at first, you know, the size of the districts, some, some districts are tiny, and so yeah, it might be a building. Okay, yeah. thank you. So we're, we're going after the middle, we're not going after the whales initially, we just happen to be in Baltimore City, which is one yeah. of those 80,000 student districts, and, and they're doing a large pilot, so we're excited about that. Hi Beth, Hi. quick question for you. Um, how do you handle, I, I understand nuanced vocabulary, and I'm sure you've either encountered or read Hayakawa's work, Yes. Yeah. Um, the question is, how do you handle neologisms, acronyms, and new speak? Or <laughs> we are targeting, there are so many nuanced tier two vocabulary words, and those are the words that we're really emphasizing. So words that are going to come up over and over again that kids are going to encounter. So the, the standard process for learning vocabulary, those of us who have good vocabularies, it's because we were avid readers. So, so Oral language does not typically, we don't typically say, that was a prudent decision that you made, or you know, I appreciate that you're being compliant today. Authors are the ones who use those words. So when kids are not accessing literature, and they need to access word, um, 10 to 12 exposures to a word in a variety of contexts before they truly have a deep understanding. So what we're hoping that we're able to do, and we, we have um, Vanderbilt, University of Maryland, um, um, Johns Hopkins, Rhode Island, American University, they're all so excited to do long-term long studies on our product. Um, and so we're really focusing on those words that kids are going to need to and they're going to encounter over and over. So we're not, we're not as focusing on, on less frequent words. Great answer, thank you. Yeah, thank you. One more. Beth, just a question on how the, the application works, because it seemed like it's very much a didactic fo focused 
uh, program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a self-paced component to this? How much of this re re relies on the student actually conducting that work? And how do the, how do the instructors actually awesome. see that? Okay. I knew I wasn't gonna have time to show. Um, this is a very, very um, um, differentiate, you know, there's a lot of differentiation. So our, all of our words that are in our system and we're constantly growing and adding words are related, um, they're on grade level. So 85% of the words in our system are found in the words worth teaching by B. Miller. Um, and then the teacher has the ability to, let's say they're teaching the novel The Giver or Outsiders or, you know, Big Friendly Giant or even Stella Luna, you know, for kindergarten or To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, they're able to go into the system and assign words from those novels to students. And so they're getting um, whatever self-paced, a lot of our, our current um, customers are using this as a homework supplemental, so it's kind of a flipped classroom okay. way. So, um, and then we're hearing teachers saying things like, my students weren't able to visualize, you know, they would encounter a word and they're not visualizing it, and now they're able to remember what they saw, and then they're able to create a new visual image for, based on the content. So during a read aloud, the kids are going, I learned that word in vocabulary. Um, so, so it's very self-paced. The teachers can assign, you know, as much or as little homework. They can do, you know, it's it's a very, very flexible tool. Thank you. Oh. We are a company from Brazil that creates technology to support teachers and the communities to improve dropout rates. There is a huge problem in developing countries and also to improve proficiency using all the data that we collect to foster new public policies. In Brazil, we have 42 million students in public schools. 75% of them use math forms and their teachers almost 100%. And dropout rate is a huge problem. For example, 6.6% of our high school students will lose every year. So our students, they are from primary to high school, the ones that we approach, and they are also from the low-income families, less than ten dollars per day, per month. Teachers, they are overwhelmed and they work more than 50 hours per week, and they have less than 50% of the time on their reading and they is really low wage. That we face, and this is how people get track of attendance in usually in developing countries. So they have a great sheet, and it's write down everything. And they lose 20% of the time on test with the great sheets to track attendance and to track content as well. And uh, uh, also, they try to update this data inside the database of the states of this palace once every two months. So they have no data accuracy and have no time to answer or to call the parents and to solve the problem. What we do is like this, we integrated our database with the state's database and keep track of the students. We send SMS messages to the parents every day and we also have tools to track the content that they are teaching and the behavior of the students. With this kind of information, we try to improve dropout rates and also increase students' proficiency, increasing time on test. Right now, we have a pilot with 130,000 students in 230 schools. Last four months, we impacted the dropout rate between 5 and 10% after the three months only. We scaled to 90% of the schools in three weeks with only word of mouth. And the retention rate was above 50% after 90 days. Among our active user base, 60, more than 60% of the classes use our tools. And right now we are negotiating to impact 1.4 million students in 2018, reach a deal 600,000. Our go to market is providing services to states and municipalities, public bids, usually in developing countries like Brazil. The market is really concentrated in the sense that you have one person deciding for 100,000, 200,000 students. So the sales process is kind of different from the US when you have the district. And you only charge 40 cents per student per month. Then this you charge a little bit more with the assessment tool that we are developing for 2018. So what differentiates us from the other companies globally, I'm not talking about Brazil here, we are in fact driven data science to improve. Our database is better than the state and municipality's database. We are focused on vulnerable areas. Our app really works anywhere in Brazil or anywhere in a developing country. It's not client for us, we sponsor data plans. It's 100% reliable and it makes a huge difference in the adoption. 
Is it scalable? No training needed. It's tailor made for low tech proficient teachers and very low cost, affordable to developing countries. Because in the end, we believe that tech won't change education, encourage people will do it. Thank you. Hi, hi, Rangel. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you're measuring? I wasn't entirely clear on that, other than forms of engagement. We measure three things today. The first thing that we measure is attendance. Every day we measure the attendance, and we are able to provide the parents with the methods, and we are able to provide the state and the scholars with the reports. So they are able to, I would say, answer these kids, contacting the families directly or sending publications there to talk with the families. That's one thing. We track also the content that the teachers are teaching. They mark, they need to track in their reaches, so they track in our app, and you're able to check if they are following the curriculum or not. And the last thing, we track the behavior of these students. There are a lot of things to show, I'm sorry, in a long time, but we track the behavior of these students. So we have the data to cross-check with their grades and with their attendance. To try to build a predictive model regarding if they are going to let drop out school or not. And just tell me a little bit more about behavior. What? How are you measuring or interpreting behavior? It's the same question that I had in the first the same finals. Behavior is easy in the sense that, okay, and I can show after the presentation, but you check the student's name, and then you have five compliments that you can give and five opportunities to improve. It needs to be not open to anything because you need to track, first of all, and then the teacher in the presentation tries to make they send bad sentence to parents sometimes. So to avoid this kind of stuff, we have five metrics, very simple. And then they mark. In average, they mark one sentence per two, per two students per week. So with them in mind, we have the middle group, the top group, and the group that needs help. Thank you. Hey, can I just ask a couple questions? One is, what kind of research do you do in market to look at the kind of root causes for dropping out of school. Um, and secondly, can you just elaborate on your theory of change? Is it that by tracking these three things, we will improve the dropout yeah. rate? So the dropout rates, we have a lot of reasons. The first one would be socioeconomic mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. The other one, you have pregnancy as well. Mm -hmm. And the main reason is that families, they usually they don't care a lot about education because of their background, right. their own, because of their mm -hmm. background. So if we start to close the gap between schools and families, and there are, there are a lot of research here, even here in the US, from the Berkman, mm -hmm. and they're gonna have what? Effects between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 standard deviations mm -hmm. regarding dropout rates, if you close the gap between schools and families. So this is the first theory of change that we have, closing this gap. And about all the data, if we cross-check the data, we kind of understand the reasons behind this student absence. Then we look at the attendance, the content, and the behavior, and try to understand how we can influence public policies with the states, with our clients, with municipalities, to say, to say, okay, now let's try to make a marketing campaign to ah, families should come more to the school, or students this way receive more compliments. Compliments, for example, there's a lot of research here in the US saying that compliments uh, may improve the students' self esteem and then makes them improve in proficiency. Mm -hmm. I got a quick question for you on um, is it a fair assessment to say that your value add is awareness and efficiency yes. to enable impact rather than impact itself? Yes. Okay. Now, So another question. Uh, so you, you said it early on in the presentation that uh, you, the product would work with instructors who were less facile with technology. There's clearly a heavy reliance on them to use the application. What's the training model? How do you introduce? No training the model. There's no training model. It's software as a service and it's No training model at all. But how do you, if you're relying on them for the input, how do you, how, what's, what's the process for ensuring that they're actually using the application so you get the fidelity of the results that you're expecting? Now, it's funny because we have a fidelity check. 
last week we run it all our database. Just that check for A is equals to hospitality data. In the sense that, for example, if you mark everyone present every day, it's false. The data is false. So for it's one of the tests that we run last week. And it was less than one percent of it. They want to do the right thing. They only have they don't have the tools. If they had to go into the record, they should need to be really, really that's, We have a huge focus on UX. You better see there's no training in this. It needs to be as dumb as what's up. <laughs> <laughs> My name is David Aline. I'm the founder and CEO of Enquity. Uh, before I jump into it, I want to start by telling a tale of Jefferson. Not our founding father, rather a student that I had the personal privilege of working with in my former capacity as the executive director of a nonprofit college access organization that I founded and operated here in New York City. I met Jefferson as part of a uh, this guy. But I met Jefferson as part <laughs> of a summer program that we were running for recently graduated high school seniors to help them plan for and financially prepare for their upcoming college experience. I learned a few things very quickly from working with Jefferson. He was a wonderful person. He was uh, extremely kind and warm and really dedicated to succeed at the next level. But I also learned that he was planning to borrow $11,000 per year to attend a distant community college at which the graduation rate and transfer rate were both below 20%, and graduates were earning less than $18,000 a year. He revealed to me that no one had ever talked to him about the financial implications of his college experience, and he didn't feel like he had a go-to resource to rely on. And while I begged him to pursue more affordable pathways locally, he was scared by how late it was in the process, and he didn't want to disappoint his parents. Two things dawned on me from that experience. The first is that it is heartbreaking that our students don't have a go-to resource to help them understand and navigate through the financial implications of their college decision, and Jefferson had been set up for financial failure. Unfortunately, he's not alone. Right now, four out of five low-income students and nearly 50% of all students drop out, with financial pressure being by far at 70%, the number one reason, and a new student is going into loan default every 29 seconds. At a time when the post-secondary credential is as critical as it's ever been, the way our students interact with the college process is directly setting millions of them up for financial failure. The problem for students is also a problem for the institutional stakeholders responsible for them, and most notably, financially induced dropout represents nearly $5 billion in lost tuition revenue among colleges and universities. It is time to stop the bleeding, and to that end, we've introduced Equity, the first of its kind college financial matching, planning, and budgeting solution for high school and college students, supporting students as a to and through support around all of the financial decisions on that long journey to college graduation. Here's how Equity would have supported Jefferson. First, as he was doing that upfront research, Equity would have prescribed for him a financially optimal list of schools based on his own personal academic and financial information and helped him evaluate those schools on the basis of projected financial wellness. Once he narrowed down that list, Equity would have developed an automated financial plan for his college success that took into consideration nuanced factors like his own personal spending preferences, the actual geographic cost of living, projected weekly work burdens and availability, and his actual financial aid. Finally, Equity would have bridged that gap between high school intention and college action by offering real-time money management support to keep him on his path to graduation. Should he have been falling off that path, Equity would have helped his university understand his risk profile of dropping out for financial reasons so that the university could have released an emergency grant or stepped in in other ways. Taken together, Equity would have helped ensure that Jefferson got to graduation. It would have thus helped boost his lifetime earnings and in doing so would have mitigated his risk of default. And by doing that, it would have improved the expected value of his tuition revenue to the university. To date, we've been selling equity on an annual per student license basis to high schools. And when we launch our budgeting app in Q3 of next year, we'll also be selling an annual SaaS uh, to colleges, charging $50 per year for access to student uh, information around their financial risk profile. We're also going to start exploring a B2C channel in Q1 of next year. Well, we'll be offering uh, this for free to Pell eligible students, but charging middle income and upper middle income families $5 a month. 
This is a massive market opportunity, uh, particularly understanding that college students spend $520 billion a year annually, making the referral market particularly large. And it's a market that's ripe for the taking. As existing guidance and retention providers are fragmented across K-12 and higher ed, and there isn't one that supports students through the financial implications at the high school or college levels. And we've begun to tap into the market. So we launched our full beta in September and have generated $30,000 in Q4 revenue with partners that include the DC Public School District and Idea Public Schools. We are also just accepted into the Wells Fargo Startup Accelerator through which we're now currently exploring potential product integrations with the bank as well as different distribution opportunities. We are the right team to solve this problem and win the market. So my co-founders and I, as I mentioned, previously founded and operated a nonprofit college access organization, and thus we've seen this problem play out and understand the nuances of the issue deeply. Our CTO was the former CTO of a company that uh, offered a beautiful budgeting app that went through uh, a notable uh, FinTech accelerator, and our UX UI designer has herself worked for both EdTech and FinTech startups. Uh, we hope that you will join us on putting our students on a path to future financial success. Thank you very much. David, how do you um, reach your customer? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So today we've been uh, predominantly working with nonprofit college access organizations that serve students at scale. Obviously, there are limits to that. Uh, we've been working with individual schools and districts, but at scale, we want to build partnerships with a lot of you as gatekeepers to the space. So the Common Apps of the World, the Coalitions for Affordability, Access, and Success. Uh, College Board, Naviance, which is probably the largest competitor in the guidance space, but doesn't do anything on the financial planning and access side. Uh, so that's sort of how we want to go to market at scale. Uh, as I mentioned, we're also going to start going direct to consumer. We um, want to leverage the Wells Fargo relationship. Uh, we've also released a new product that helps students easily, accessibly, and accurately complete an electronically filed FAFSA, which we're going to make for free. Um, and we view that as a potential lead general as well on a direct to consumer basis. Thanks. Can you go over your business model again, one more time, please? Sure. So to date, it's been B2B to C. Um, so we've been selling into high schools uh, and nonprofit college access organization. We're also going to start selling to colleges, where what we will be selling is the ability to understand the risk profile of the student from a financial retention standpoint. We are pivoting a little bit to start going uh, direct yeah, to consumer. Part of this is obviously the length of the sales cycle. We want to bring in another revenue. And there is a tier of consumer that I would put in financial aid no man's land. So you're not getting the Pell Grant, but you're still not earning enough for college is affordable for you. We believe that these uh, customers can subsidize the cost for our low-income students who can get it. So at $50 a student year, uh, you're, you're in the same ballpark as some of the big enterprise players. Which wallet share are you competing for on a campus? So we've been working with um, academic success teams to date. So here in New York, we've been working very closely with uh, John Jay College's academic success team. They've been working with us as we build out our tool to make sure that it meets the administrator's side and it meets their needs. Um, you know, we know this will differ from college to college, and whether it's retention, retention, academic success, potentially financial aid. Um, those are usually the three uh, departments of the universities that have expressed tangential interest in what we're doing. Um, but we probably won't be uniform across college. And, and in the revenue model on that mix, what do you view as the largest addressable market yeah, for spend? So um, the B2C channel ultimately will be the largest, and then the college will be the second largest. We start at the high school level because that's where the problem starts. Uh, and ultimately, you know, with a partnership like a potential Wells Fargo relationship where we could be referring to them for different offerings, uh, we have a customer acquisition advantage, particularly for our, our uh, budgeting app. So the budgeting app space is very saturated. Um, but we do have a unique customer acquisition advantage because we're working with students at the high school level and are actually onboarding them onto that platform in high school. One of the issues that college budgeting apps face uh, is that they're competing not with other budgeting apps, but they're competing with Instagram and Facebook for students' time. Um, so we get over that hump by starting at the high school level so it's turned to be at the college level. Um, long term, we think there are exciting opportunities to help low-income students with credit. Um, that's something we want to do down the road. We need to build a brand of trust and equity first, uh, but that could also itself be a larger market. And, and what are your biggest dependencies to scale? Um, so the biggest dependencies to scale will be finding the right partnerships. I think Wells will help. Um, that is going to be you know, partnerships like the Wells, partnerships like College Board. Those will be critical for us to reach scale. Um, 
Also, being able to compete in the FAFSA space, I think, will be helpful. I mean, there is an incumbent now, um, and we have been working very closely with the council community here in New York to make sure that that product is bulletproof from a substantive standpoint, because there's no real room for error when it comes to FAFSA submission. Um, but being able to do that well, I think, will also help with scale. Just so I don't have to speculate, what happened to Jefferson? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> part of the problem in our profit was a lot of data tracking, right? Is that it's based on survey data. And I don't have an app where I can look and see how the students do. So, we stayed in touch for, um, you know, I tried to pin him by email as much as I could over the first couple months, and then he stopped responding to this. Um, so, I don't want to speculate. I hope that he's doing well and that he's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Joining me and giving a big round of applause to all these entrepreneurs. <laughs> so the judges are going to step back for a few minutes to deliberate and pick the company that best meets the needs of their serve learners and provides access uh, for high quality education. So Vicky's going to move away and um, hopefully we'll be back in five, ten minutes. Um, In the meantime, um, I'll introduce my colleague, Jason Walters, from the Building for Social Innovation Team. Um, Paul is one of the several social innovation initiatives in Pearson that drive access to underserved uh, learners, high quality education to underserved learners. Uh, Jason's going to talk about the various uh, other initiatives at Pearson. Uh, okay, thanks, TT. I'm kind of the interlude here as you wait for the judges to react to the questions. So, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on Pearson's sustainability plan overall. Um, what is sustainability at Pearson? So, what we're talking about today, um, there's a broad set of functions that fit into Pearson's sustainability plan. Um, it's essentially something that's owned by everybody in the company. Um, it has to be in order for us to have the impacts that we want to have and integrate sustainability into the business um, overall. So we look after and try to help support and manage the social, environmental, and economic impacts that the company has, basically. So we have a 2020 sustainability plan. Um, and where does that plan come from? It comes from our purpose behind sustainability. It also comes from um, the values that we have as a company, which are brave, imaginative, decent, um, and accountable, and it comes from our commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and three goals in particular, UN SDG 4 around education, 8 around promoting decent jobs and inclusive economic growth, and 10 around fighting inequality, essentially. So that's the basis for our sustainability program plans. Um, sorry. Um, it has, we have three pillars that the plan is structured under. The first one is be a trusted partner, which is, which is essentially talking about how can Pearson be a good partner um, to all of the people that we do business with and the people we have impacts on all across our value chain. From the university and learners to our own employees, to the workers who make our products and our supply chain, to the communities where we do business and invest. And we do that in particular through two aspects. One of them is looking after um, human rights and social impacts. So we're in the process of developing the human rights strategy. We also do it through our environmental impact. We've been carbon neutral since 2012, uh, and we have pretty ambitious carbon, uh, carbon emission goals to meet by 2020. In Pillar 2, which is most closely aligned with today's program, we focus on reaching more learners, and particularly underserved and disadvantaged learners who aren't getting the opportunities that they should get right now. We do that on, um, through our products and services. We have a number of products that are aimed at developmental education and career success for people who are kind of behind the curve and need help catching up and need to stay on that path to meet their goals. And we also do it through a number uh, of other collaboration and partnership and multi-stakeholder organizations. So we work with organizations like the um, DFID in the UK, local ministries of education, and local civil society organizations and NGOs to address big global challenges in education, like education for refugees, we are partnering with Save the Children um, in Jordan, and uh, with CAMFED, where we're partnering to help women learners in developing countries in Africa, including Zimbabwe and Tanzania. Uh, the last pillar here is shaping the future of learning. Um, so there's a lot that comes under here, but essentially it's work. We're focusing on using technology to improve learning outcomes and access. Um, this is being led by a number of areas of the business. One of these includes a partnership with IBM, which is 
um, looking to expand tutoring, give everyone the chance to have access to tutoring in the long term. Um, we do that by building skills that foster employability and inclusive growth. That includes soft skills and technical skills for people all, al all along their educational journey to help them enter um, and improve their skills and um, seek more opportunities. We do it by promoting education for sustainable development. So we have something called the Global Learning Program, if you haven't heard of it, which promotes sustainable development and education in K-12 schools um, in the UK, which is funded by the UK's um, investment organization. And then we contribute to global research and dialogue by partnering with leaders in the education, um, in education sector and promoting open, uh, we have an open ideas section, open ideas set of uh, research that, that um, seeks to make research and new developments accessible to the public and, from, and help raise the bar in terms of educational practices and insights, and by partnering with um, other organizations like the World Economic Forum, uh, Business Fights Poverty, the Bus Business and Sustainable Development Commission, the Global Partnership for Education to promote thought leadership in education and to promote more responsible business practice purposes by private companies through sustainability. So um, why do we do this though? Ultimately, sustainability has to, to support and align with the company's mission to um, help learners improve, improve, make progress in their lives through learning, essentially. Um, sustainability isn't something that we do on the side, it's something that's integrated into Pearson's core mission and strategy. Um, so it has to make sense for the business as well as for the learners and all the people that we're trying to have a positive social impact on. Um, so in particular, um, and as you've seen through the activities that are, going, that are going on here through Dan, the work that Prof does, we're, in, we're focusing on identifying on the needs, the unmet needs of underserved and disadvantaged learners and helping to solve those, and in the process aiming to help address big global challenges in education. We're looking to take that knowledge and integrate it into um, our current products and new product opportunities. So to find new ways to market and make better and effective use of our current products for disadvantaged <coughs> learners, and to identify new products and service offerings that can help disadvantaged learners make more progress. And ultimately, we hope this will contribute to creating a culture of innovation, smart risk taking, and long-term sustainable value creation for Pearson that serves the business, but also serves all the stakeholders and learners that we serve as a company. Uh, so we, one of the ways that we implement our sustainability plan, one, because there's a number of different um, functions and activities that we perform, um, is through community investment activities. And our community, sorry, investment um, is, uh, the focus of our community, ex community investment is to improve opportunities and education access for underserved learners. We're, we're committed through something called the London Benchmarking Group to uh, investing at least 1% of our pre-tax profits every year annually in these community investment activities. And we do that through three main categories that are listed here, strategic philanthropy, social innovation, and employee engagement. Strategic philanthropy involves some of the partnerships that I was talking about earlier. It's where we can intervene to address big challenges that aren't necessarily um, that amenable or that well suited to private sector solutions at this point. Uh, social innovation involves what we've been talking about here, through, uh, the, the learning fund and the work that we're doing to actually develop new products and services um, and new business models that help to, um, to help to serve and benefit underserved learners. And employee engagement. So how can we help all of our employees actually get out into the, into the communities and apply their own knowledge that they have and experience that they have on their jobs to help the communities where we do business? Uh, so this, these are just a few examples um, of what falls under each of those three categories of our social investment, um, our community investment. So strategic philanthropy, I've actually talked about um, the CANFA program a little bit, and the Save the Children program. The Save the Children program, um, I think, is particularly interesting because it cuts across a number of areas. Um, we're supporting new models of education um, in uh, centered around refugee education in Jordan that include, um, include teacher training, include psych psychosocial support and development, um, and new forms of, of, um, of interacting with them. It also includes a uh, learner-centered learner design or a new math learning app. So that app is called Space Hero. If you're interested in checking it out, it's on the, it's on the Apple Play Store. It's in Arabic, but it's essentially a way to um, help refugee children and people who are outside of the education system right now um, develop, improve, and get excited about uh, learning that. Uh, in the social innovation category, we have something, the internal innovation incubator, which is our market's incubator. 
we have uh, the PALS, which you're here today for, and we have a number of employee engagement opportunities, one of those being Kiva. Um, then Pearson was actually the, uh, had the second number of companies, had the second number of largest loans on uh, Kiva and the most participation in last year, actually. So we've had good support and a lot of um, you know, active engagement from employees and that. Uh, I think TT is going to give you a little bit more. I, I think uh, we're just going to wait for it. Th thanks, Jason. Uh, we're just going to wait for the judges to deliberate a bit further. Um, and in the meantime, just sit in your seats and network to the person to the left and right of you. Um, if you have any other... Is this the mic that doesn't work? Want this one? Hey everyone, thank you for waiting. We had a, a spirited judges debate and um, you know, we really loved all the presentations here. So thanks again to the presenters for coming out here um, and, and doing this with us. Uh, you know, the judges really liked some, something about every single company. So what we wanna do is to walk through uh, the companies that presented in order and provide some feedback to you, each of you. Um, so I think we'll start with the Thank you. I'll do this so that you don't have to do this. Thank you. Sean. Where are you? Back here. There you are. Okay. So I just want to tell you, can you guys hear me if I don't use the mic? Yes. Okay. So I love your idea, the affordable uh, college. I think it's, uh, it's sad that only 24%, we know the role community colleges play. And I completely agree with you. There's absolutely a huge future for community coll uh, colleges in terms of as we look at the overall model in education. We know the U.S. is a single path to... Uh, uh, educational system as a K-12 person, it's unfortunate. I do think we need multiple and alternative paths like many other countries around the world that have showcased how effectively those models work, namely in Switzerland, Germany, etc. However, what I really liked about your model in particular is the focus it had on low-income, minority, immigrant, first-time uh, you know, families that are the first time to go into colleges, and, and we know particularly the importance for that population to be able to attain four-year colleges and be able to transfer using in effectively the two-year model to shift into a four-year college, get a degree, and everything else that comes along with it, including the American dream. So as such, I love the impact focus on a population that really needs it. And I really wanted to tell you, it's, I think it's a great thing, and I loved your, uh, your idea. Oh, thank you. Where's Ahmet and Julio? Oh, hey. So I live uh, about 24 miles north on the Hudson. Tappanzi Bridge is being built, or almost finished, but it's been in the process of being built for four and a half years. One of the key drivers of the length of time, which is double what the expectations were, was lack of uh, skilled workers in the middle skill area. They had to bus or fly them in. Uh, to do underwater welding, uh, to do the construction of the bridge, and actually the um, laying down of the, of the pylons and so forth. So this is a big issue. Now, we see it through the lens of our career list, our vote tech list, and our automotive mechanics list is older products are now selling better than they did um, in prior years. And so it is a big market. It's an underserved market. And it relates a little bit to what Palama is saying, uh, that um, we don't really create alternative paths. The American dream is associated with, uh, among other things, y your degree. And I happen to notice that you went to Yale. That's a great, <laughs> great distinction. But many other countries uh, have paths for vocations. And they're not thought of uh, as pejorative in any way. They're thought of as the needs of the society. And that uh, I'm serious when I say that the infrastructure to rebuild this country is, is going to take a long time unless we get these skills. And I thought, um, I thought your presentation was excellent. I think the societal need is there. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for, uh, for speaking to us today. Thank you. Research, evidence-based development you're putting into it. Um, we're spending a lot of time at Pearson thinking about authentic assessment and how we're going to scale that. Uh, and you know, from a impact, you know, my point of view, it's a, it's a market I'm not that familiar with. 
but when I think about language and literacy, clearly these kinds of uh, instructional models are going to improve people's lives, and, and you could see how this would have the biggest impact on you know, an underserved population, a population for which English is not their, their first language, uh, and for which their community and infrastructure may not be giving them the best day-to-day kind of model. So I love the, the evidence-based work, I love the design that you showed, and, and uh, love the product. Thank you. I might butcher your name, but is it Ranjit? Yeah. Uh, was that right? Was there, is that the right pronunciation of your name? Oh, okay, great. So thank you so much. We love the presentation. Um, you know, a lot of time has been sent, uh, spent by the international community solving for the problem of out of school population of children, and not enough has been spent solving for getting those children in school and learning so that they don't drop out. And we know that the primary school rates, you know, the, the number of children in primary school then drops off as they go further and further <coughs> up the chain. So I think the problem that you're solving for, we all agreed, was a huge problem, a very real problem, and hugely important. Um, what we really liked about this was the opportunities that you're looking at to deploy it without a lot of training, which is really key. I think in resource limited countries in particular where um, schools are far apart in particular. Um, and it's very clear that you've taken great care to um, ensure that it's a, it's a, the technology is flexible so that you can do this offline and upload later. And so we really, really appreciated the care with, with which you put, put that model forward and we see the potential to scale it. So thank you very much. So David, I uh, want to also uh, comment on both my sort of personal uh, passion and the groups for equity. Um, one, one thing that we love about equity actually is the, the name. Um, because they, I, think all, I think all of these uh, proposals actually are addressing the very real both problems and opportunities about um, equity in society and the role of education and access to quality education, inclusive access to quality education. As, as one of the solutions there. Um, what we particularly liked about equity um, was really, I think, the combination of the, again, the, the scale of the problem, the size of the problem, the um, recognize the consequences of not solving it, um, but also the scalability of the solution, um, I think, really stood out in terms of um, the sort of both market segmentations, but, but the sort of simplicity of a scalable software solution really stood out as, again, all of these ideas are, are very creative approaches um, to solving the equity problem, so to speak, um, but really, really admired and liked sort of the, the balance of the scale potential for what you presented to us. Um, so, so clearly you've heard from a panel who uh, shared both the personal and collective uh, views of the merits of what all of you have done. We had a good debate out there, et cetera, but we had to, we had to land on um, a winner, um, and the winner that we thought uh, amongst a lot of good competition was equity. So David, congratulations. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I get the, the prize for this wiki or TT. Oh, yeah. Tickets to Southwest for your team, your, your co-founders, and then you'll have a chance to interact with our, our team for Awesome. Thank you. So if I could just say on behalf of Pearson, a, a, a couple of other um, sort of closing thoughts um, or, or thank yous to the group. Again, thank you everybody for coming and having an interest in these. Again, thank you for um, all the finalists around here. You've got really excellent ideas, and we encourage you to stick with them. Um, any of us are available to any of you for more in-depth feedback, and we can bring other Pearson colleagues into that as well. So that's an open invitation. And Derek, we do the sort of leadership team, but we're, we want to support your success. We believe in what you're doing. And I think one of the things that brings all of us in a room like this is, is uh, a shared sense of, again, purpose of, of the role of education. In, in hopefully contributing not only to the kind of access to underserved learners that we talked about um, here, but as a consequence of that, a better world for more people, a more peaceful world. Um, there's a, a Pearson's a company with a lot of heart, uh, as well as sort of, I think, commercial chops. Um, it's what bring, keeps and brings us here as well. Uh, and there's a number of things we do beyond this to support this kind of activity. 
So beyond sort of our day-to-day -day commercial, we're proud to be a part of this. We're proud for other means by which we support investment in sort of the, the long-term return for education and reaching underserved learners and running internal incubators, a whole slate of programs, which I won't tell you about here, but you're welcome to learn about and support. But I think it's one of the things that really brings us in uh, as a, a shared sense of sort of purpose here. So thank you again, everybody, for all that. And uh, have a great day. And great